Hello everybody, welcome to this afternoon's talk. Um, I'm very proud to be introducing Professor Philip um, Maney from University of Oxford who's talking to us this afternoon. I'm John King from this university. Um, so th this talk is part of a conference in mathematical biology being held here with 850 participants. Um, the talks across that conference are almost all highly technical. Philip's one will be accessible to a very wide audience, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, among that community, Philip is clearly a star, although he's going to refer to Beckham later. I think I would equate him to Gareth Bale because he's still active. Um, but when you hear Philip's accent, you may realize that's not an analogy he especially appreciates. Um, we were delighted he agreed to give this talk. We weren't surprised in the sense simply Philip is extremely helpful. He's highly modest. He's very down to earth. Um, one doesn't always expect that of someone as eminent as Philip is or indeed perhaps of some of the other newsworthy members um, of his, their products of his own institution. Um, but with that, I will hand straight over to Philip. So thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you, John. Thank you for the introduction. And so as John said, this is going to be, um, because it's a wide range of audience, I'm going to assume no mathematical um, ability at all amongst people. So, um, so I'm going to start off by talking about um, squirrels and cancer. And one thing I want to try and get across in this talk how, is how the same type of mathematics can be used across a lot of different areas. Okay, so if you look at cancer, so you can, in a very, very simple way, think that in the body, cells divide and they die. And so these are very tightly controlled so that the net result is you have, roughly speaking, the same number of cells at any time. And then, and that's called homeostasis, and that means you sit at a steady state. But what happens is you can get mutations in cell proliferation, which means that cells divide more than they should. You get, you get mutations, which means that cells don't die when they should. And the net result of that is this balance is disturbed. And you move out of steady state, and that's when you get problems. So one of the big questions is, how can we control a growing population of cells? But there's a long history, a much longer history in ecology of studying this type of problem than there is in physiology. So the question is, can we draw lessons from, from that? So if we think of cancer as being an invasion of the body, can we look at how species invade a territory and then understand something from that about how we could deal with them, okay? So this is the indigenous gray, uh, um, red squirrel in the UK and probably very few people have seen this creature and the reason for that is because of this creature. So in the early part of the 1900s, this individual, not this actual individual, but this species was introduced to the UK and has taken over, and I'm sure virtually everybody's seen one of these. And the question is, why did it take over and how can we stop it from taking over? And there have been many, many uh, attempts to get rid of the grey squirrel and none of them have succeeded. Okay? So they were introduced around 1900 and then they've um, spread through much of Britain and the red has disappeared. Okay, so I apologize for the quality of this slide. So this is, this is part of the UK, so this is sort of where Norwich and Cambridge are around here, London's around here, and they, the squirrels were introduced around this part, the grey squirrels. So if you look at these boxes, where they're colored, means that somebody saw a red squirrel. And this runs from 1962 right through to 1979. And what you see is the boxes disappear as the gray squirrel takes over from the red squirrel. And why is that a problem? Well, the gray squirrels are very destructive. They're not very well behaved. They take, they harmful to trees, they steal birds. This is, these are quotations taken from research papers. So, um, 
This person here said they cleared one of his trees of plums in the night. Okay? So that's pretty good going. Didn't say how many plums there are or how many squirrels there were. And then this is quite a good thing here. The Rat and Sparrow Clubs offered six pence a head to kill grey squirrels. So six pence, that is six old pence before decimalization. So that's two and a half pence um, of, of today's money. And in 1926, that's actually quite a lot of money. So really it would have been worthwhile to just go out and start killing grey squirrels. Not only do you get a lot of fun out of doing that, um, you can also make a lot of money. Okay? I should say I'm a vegetarian, so I don't approve of killing animals. Okay, so just a little bit of mathematics for how you model a single species. And the, these are actually just taken from my colleague Ruth Baker's lecture notes. So the general idea is you say, let the species have density n, and then dn by dt is the rate at which that species increases. And the simplest thing to say is that it's proportional to the population times some other thing. So, for instance, the simplest thing to say is that there's a constant birth rate and a constant death rate. So the birth rate will increase n and the death rate will decrease n. So if you, b minus d is r, and if r is positive, then you have this equation here, dn by dt is r times n. And what that says is if you start off with some n, then the rate at which n increases will be positive. So n will get bigger. And then you put the bigger n into here. This is even bigger, so n will get even bigger. So what you will end up getting will be exponential growth. Okay? And exponential growth is actually a very good description of the early growth of lots of species, bacteria, cancer cells, populations of, of um, people, populations of yeast and various other animals. But obviously, they don't just keep, keep growing exponentially because eventually they'd run out of food. So the simplest way to bring food into it is to say that if not only should G, which is the per capita growth rate, depend on R, it should be modulated by something of the form 1 minus N. So this is a measure of the amount of food. So for example, if N is very small, you can ignore this and we get back to R. So we get back to exponential growth. But as N gets bigger, this term starts to go to zero. So the growth rate decreases and then you get logistic growth. So here, for example, you have exponential growth to begin with and then it tapers off and goes to a steady state. And then here, if you start off very large, it goes down like this because here we started off, so this is negative and then it decreases there. And the very important line is this line here. This is the line where this term is zero. And all we need to know to understand the behavior of this equation really is where this line is. As long as you know where that line is, we know how this equation will behave. Because if we know this is where this is zero, then below it, it's positive, which means the population will increase. Above it, it's negative, so the population decreases. And that's all we need to know. So what we can do is take this model and apply it to red and gray squirrels. So here's the red squirrel, and if that G wasn't there, then we'd have logistic growth. So we've got R, 2 times big R, which is the exponential growth, and then as R increases, K2 minus R is a measure of the amount of resource left. So as R increases due to the R2, K2 minus R gets smaller, and therefore you go to a steady state. But now the gray competes with the red, and so the red can't go to the level K2. It goes to the level K2 minus A2G. So it goes to a lower level. 
And the same thing happens for the grey, competing with the red. And so remember we said that in order to understand these equations, we just need to know where is this zero and where is this zero. And these are two straight lines. So let's plot these two straight lines. Here we are here and here we are here. This is the line where dr by dt is, is zero. Below it, dr by dt is positive. Above it, it's negative. This is the line where dg by dt is zero. Below it, it's positive. Above it, it's negative. So suppose we're sitting here, so we have lots of gray squirrels. What's going to happen? Well, r dot, that just is shorthand for dt, dr by dt, that's positive, so r will grow. dg by dt is positive, so g will grow. So I have to draw a line with r growing and g growing. So that means I'll draw this line. And now, crucially, what will happen is I'll hit this red line. Beyond this red line, r dot becomes negative. So r starts to decrease. Decrease up. And now we've got all greys and no reds. So grey wins. So then we decide, let's go out this afternoon, make some money by killing the squirrels, the grey squirrels. And they'll get six pence for each grey squirrel we kill, okay? And um, so we kill lots of grey squirrels, go down like this, kill, 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 down to here, and then we think, oh, now it's time for a nice cup of tea. So we go off, have a nice cup of tea, job nicely well done, we're all very happy with ourselves, but what happens? Here, R dot is still positive, so R starts to grow, but G dot is still positive, so G starts to grow. So it starts to grow and goes back up. So no matter how many we kill here, we will always go back to this point here, according to this mathematical model. Okay? So it doesn't matter how many greys you kill, it will go back to there. So this is quite good if you want to make money because it means that you can keep on killing them and keep getting six pence ahead. This was 1926, which it's not, unfortunately. Um, so you go back to there, okay? And you see that the crucial reason is that this line is below this line. That's the reason why the culling doesn't work. If you were to change these values, because there's no reason why this line has to be below this line. If you change these values, you could have this situation. So now let's start off in the same place. We'd go up to there. So now we go, we kill, 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 kill the greys till we go down here, go off to have a nice cup of tea. Population starts to grow, and now we hit the black line first. And because we hit the black line first, the greys start to decrease. And then we go to here, and now uh, the reds win. So we have to do two things to get rid of the squirrels. One thing is we have to kill them to come down to here. And the second thing is we have to change these values to make these lines intersect like this. The first one is easy to do, the second one is not easy to do. What do these lines mean? What do these terms mean? Well, these terms mean, one thing they mean is the food. So we could say, well, why don't we just plant trees that red squirrels like and grey squirrels don't? Well, that won't work because the red squirrels and the grey squirrels like the same tree the same nuts from the same tree. But the grey squirrel eats other stuff. You've seen them foraging in bins and eating all stuff out of bins. So they've got a, wide, a broader um, food, uh, range of food than the red squirrels, so we can't increase the food for the red squirrels without increasing the food for the grey squirrels. So what we could do instead is we could make 
we could decrease the rate of growth of the grey squirrels. So what we could do is we could institute some sort of um, sort of um, family planning for the grey squirrels, give out contraception to the grey squirrels, and although you, some of you may laugh, in fact, in regions where we're talking not about red and grey squirrels, but about insects, people do precisely that by releasing sterile insects. And when you release sterile insects, that decreases, if the insect's doing something bad, like it's eating a tree that you really want to use for wood, you decrease the growth rate of the insect by releasing sterile insects. Okay? So then we could say, these, this tells you how detrimental the red squirrel is to the grey squirrel. It sort of tells you how competitive the red squirrel is to the grey squirrel. And we can't change that either. We can't sort of institute a program that makes the red squirrel bulk up so it becomes, can fight and punch the grey squirrel away. We can't do that. Okay? So we can't actually change any of these parameters. So we're stuck. So if we're in this region, then no amount of killing the grey squirrels will help us. And this may be the reason why all the programs that have been in the UK to try and get rid of the grey squirrels haven't worked. So what's this got to do with cancer? So now let's replace the grey squirrel by cancer cells and the red squirrel by um, normal cells. And this is precisely what... Um, oh, before we do that, just want to point out something else. If you now do a simulation, so this is red squirrels everywhere, so this is at one, and then grey squirrels are zero everywhere, and then you introduce some grey squirrels. This is a video done by a former student of mine, um, Jonas Schluter. Now what you'll see will happen is the red squirrels, the grey squirrels will invade. So it's, it's difficult to see, so sorry about the colour scheme here, but now the grey squirrels have gone to one and the red squirrels have all gone to zero. So there you get that invasion. Okay? So Bob Gatenby, a friend and colleague at the Moffat Cancer Centre, he thought in exactly this same way for cancer. So he asked the question, how does cancer become more competitive than normal cells in order to beat the normal cells? And now the cancer can change the values of those parameters. And it does that by producing something called lactic acid. So he wrote down a mathematical model of that with his colleague Ed Galinsky, and what he found was two different types of behaviours. So this is um, the, the, uh, the, the tumour cells, and these are the normal cells, and this is the acid concentration, and this is a wave of invasion. So if you ran a movie of this, you would see this invading. And then he also made a prediction that it should be possible that you would see a gap between the advancing no tumour cells and the retreating normal cells. And then he actually validated that model by finding the gap. So if this is what's really happening, then you should be able to stop tumours from advancing by giving bicarbonate, which neutralises the acid. And that's precisely what they did. And you won't be able to read this, but that's okay, but this is the important picture. Here are mice in which tumour cells were implanted, and then um, these people here, Gatenby and in Roby and their group, looked to see how, how many of these cells invaded. And this is untreated mice, weren't given bicarbonate. This is the average number of um, invading, invading cells, and this is with the treated ones. You see there's quite a big difference there. So this leads to 
using this mathematical model, it's led them to think in a different way of how to treat a tumour. Because in many cases, people think of how to treat a tumour is let's attack the tumour, let's treat the tumour. And what he's saying here is let's treat the environment in which the tumour lives. Let's modify that environment. And that gives you potentially a whole range of new types of um, possible therapies. And that's being explored in quite a lot of detail. So now I want to leave that because that's a sort of sad, sort of serious subject. And let's go on to talk about something that's a bit more fun and see how mathematics can be used in that. And that is in animal coat markings. So here is a cheetah sleeping. It's not dead. I didn't kill it. It's lying asleep. And how did it get all these patterns? In fact, we were told here that if you want to stroke the cheetah, you have to stroke it really firmly. Because if you stroke it not so firmly, it'll think you're a fly and it'll, it'll sort of do this and try and push you away. In fact, when the next group of people came and started to stroke the cheetah, a fly did appear. And the, the speed with which the cheetah went to push the fly away was unbelievable. The person couldn't even, didn't even move give you a sense of how quick these things are. It was, it was really quite amazing to see. So here's somebody you will all have heard of. He was uh, the subject of a movie recently, Alan Turing. And so he did a lot of work for the war effort, but towards the end of his life, he starts to look at the question of pattern formation. And what he was interested in was branching structures. So if you look at this tree, if you were to cut that tree along here and look down, you would see a circle. And that's growing. So he said, oh, there must be some chemical that's causing that tree to grow, and that chemical must be distributed in a circle. So the tree is growing in a circle. And we now know what that chemical is. It's oxen. But if you look up here, suddenly that is no longer circle. If you were to cut along here, what you would see would be a circle with a little lump on the side. So the symmetry has been broken. So he said that must mean that the, that the chemical, the growth hormone, it's no longer circular. Its symmetry is broken. So how does that happen? That's what he wanted to know. So this is his paper here, 1952, and he says it is suggested that a system of chemical substances called morphogens reacting together and diffusing through a tissue is adequate to account for the main phenomena of morphogenesis. So morphogenesis means pattern formation. So he was the first person to actually formally state that cells respond to chemicals and they change their behavior because of the chemical. And he put this forward in 1952, and some 40 years, 35 years later, people actually found these chemicals, these morphogens. So he was a generation ahead of his time in terms of um, understanding the biology. M more amazingly was the, the method mechanism he put forward for this. He said that he's going to consider a system of chemicals that when you add diffusion to them, they become unstable. Now that is, at first sense, a totally ridiculous thing to say because diffusing, diffusion is a stabilizing process. Okay? If we start off with water here and we put a little lump of um, uh, ink into the water, now we have a pattern. And after a while, that pattern disappears. There's no pattern here. And the reason for that is diffusion. You don't start off here and see this happen. 
No, you, you start off here, you see this happen. So diffusion doesn't form pattern. In fact, diffusion destroys pattern. And he showed that under the right circumstances in a system of equations, diffusion could give pattern. And then he did a simulation and to show these are types of patterns you get. Okay? And I like to imagine that when he wrote down the system of equations, which I'm not going to write down, and it involved a lot of calculation, I like to imagine him sitting there thinking to himself, I've got all these calculations to do. How on earth do I do these calculations? It's going to take a long time. What I need is a machine. What I need, oh, I invented the computer a few years ago, I'll use that. And then came up with this picture. But that's probably not what happened. Okay? And the patterning principle he came up with was something called short-range activation, long-range inhibition. And now I'm going to give you an intuitive idea of how that happens. So the idea is this. You've got two chemicals. One chemical activates itself, so it produces more of itself, but it also produces an inhibitor. And the inhibitor inhibits the activator. And that system can be stable in the absence of diffusion, but once you put diffusion in, it can become unstable if the activator moves more slowly than the inhibitor. So let's explain that with an example that's in the book of Jim Murray's. Let's consider a field, and suppose that a fire starts in the field. A fire is self-activating. What the fire will do is it will heat some of the grass next to it, and then that will catch fire. And then it will heat the grass next to it, and then that will catch fire. So it's activating itself, self-activating, autocatalysis. And now let's suppose there are grasshoppers. And let's suppose when the grasshoppers get hot, they sweat. And the sweat moistens the grass, so the grass no longer burns. So the fire is activating the grass, the grasshopper. The grasshopper is inhibiting the fire. So we've got an activator inhibitor system. And now let's suppose the fire moves very quickly. So what's going to happen? After a while, you'll get a perfectly black field with crispy, toasted grasshoppers everywhere. Very nutritious, tasty, high in protein, low in fat. Okay? Suppose now instead the fire moves more slowly than the grasshopper. What's going to happen then? Grasshoppers are going to get hot, they're going to move away from the fire, they're going to be able to outrun the fire, then they're all going to meet up, going to say, oh, it's really hot in here today, terrible weather, all this big fire started. And they're going to make all that ground really wet. When the fire comes, the fire can't um, burn that piece of grass. So at the end of it all, you're going to have big patches of grass everywhere surrounded by um, black burnt grass going to have a pattern. Okay? Short-range activation, long-range inhibition. And this is Jim Murray, who did much of the really major work in this area. And so what he did in his book was he solved Turing's model on, uh, on shapes of animals. And so what's happening here, as we go along like this, th these are getting larger but they rescale to fit on the page. So when you, when you do the mathematics of the Turing model, what you find is that if the domain is too small, you don't get any pattern. Diffusion wipes everything out. So here's an example here. There's no pattern. And then the model predicts that as the domain gets larger, you see more and more pattern. So the model predicts you should see an animal that looks like that. 
Now, I don't know if any of you have ever seen an animal that looks like that. I haven't in real life, but here's two of them. Okay? And this wasn't photoshopped. These animals actually exist. What about this animal? Anybody ever seen an animal like this? Well, I, I have in real life. And I'm sure Mark has from Scotland. It's a belted Galloway. Okay? Not looking very happy, but there we are. Okay? And now, the leopard. And here's the leopard, and here is the model. Here's a jaguar, cheetah, and here's the model. And you see that the model captures the behavior of the system. And in fact, what, it's, what you see here is that the patterns are constrained. See, people say, isn't nature wonderful? Isn't it so amazing and so beautiful? And I say rubbish to that. Nature is not diverse and wonderful because if it was, how come if you look at us or you look at a chicken or you look at a mouse or you look at a cow, look at their arm structure and the leg structure, it's all the same. One bone, then two bones, then more and more bones. If nature really was diverse like you all claim it is, then where's the animal that's got six bones here, three bones here, four bones here, two bones here, six bones here, five bones here? There isn't one. So these patterns are constrained. And the amazing thing is, if you look at Turing's model for pattern formation and you solve it and you look at the functions that give rise to the patterns, you find that they tell you that only certain patterns can form. And this leads to the idea of developmental constraints. So here, George Oster and Jim Murray did a lot of work on this. Shubin and Albrecht were both experimentalists. What they did was they went and they looked at lots of animal coats and skeletons, etc., etc., and they, by just looking at the data, came up with rules of how development is constrained. Oster and Murray, on the other hand, looked at the mathematics, the functions that are involved, and came up with developmental constraints, and they both matched. And in particular, one thing they showed was that if on the, the large domain of an animal you have a certain pattern, then on the smaller domains, the pattern can't be more complicated. So, for example, if you have spots on the main part of the domain, then you can only have spots or stripes, or nothing on the other parts of the domain. Like the tail here, you can only have stripes. You can't have a situation where you have spots on the tail and stripes on the body. So the pattern, as the domain gets simpler, the pattern cannot get more complicated. So here are some examples of this. This is, um, one of these is salamander, one is frog, can't remember which one is which. So an experiment was done very early in development where they made the domain smaller. So now the question is, will you get five digits but they'll be thinner and smaller? Or will you get fewer digits because the domain is smaller? And the theory predicts you will get the digits of the same size, but they will be fewer digits because the domain is smaller. And that's precisely what happens. What happens if you do the opposite experiment, make the domain larger? In the case of the chick, you've got three digits here. Will you still get three digits, but they'll be huge because you've got a bigger domain? Or will you get more digits of the same size because you've got a bigger domain? And the model predicts you will get more digits of the same size, and that's precisely what happens. 
So then some of these people here had this ra rather weird idea. They asked the question, if you look at the Turing patterns that form, and you look at the function that gives rise to those patterns, which are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, they asked, where else do we see this? Where do we else do we see this function? And we see it when we bang a drum. The drum oscillates and the, um, the oscillation are eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. So what they decided to do is take a plate that's shaped like an animal coat marking and vibrate it. And then using quite fancy holograph techniques, convert the amplitude of the oscillation, which is the eigenfunction, into a color. And then the prediction was, you should see animal coat markings. And you do. There we are there, there, see there, like that. Like this zebra here, so you've got these sort of things here. And you see that sort of, that triangular thing up here, which is like there. Okay. Now, another person who did a huge amount of work in this, Hans Meinhardt, who sadly died a few months ago, he has written this uh, fantastic book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Seashells, where he takes a model a little bit more complicated than the Turing model, and he shows here is a shell with patterns, and here is, um, here's the real shell, and here's the shell generated by the Turing model. So you can see you can get very, very sophisticated patterns arising. Okay? Now here is another example. This is from the work of Kondo and Asai, two Japanese scientists. Here is a fish which has got stripes, and as the fish grows and the stripes get wider apart, a stripe appears in the middle to preserve the wavelength. And this is exactly what happens in the model, prediction of the model. So now you should be thinking, well, when I was a baby, I had one head, and now I've got a lot bigger, surely I should have several heads, because the domains got larger. And just looking around here, I don't think that's happened to anyone. Um, why not? Well, cells can only respond to these cues for a certain length of time, when they're stem cell-like. After that, they're what are called fully differentiated, and then they can't respond to this chemical. So the chemical might still be present and might be doing all sorts of things. They can't respond to it. They can't read it. And in fact, the link between this and cancer is that in cancer, cells revert and become embryonic-like and start to form patterns and structures again when they shouldn't be doing. So understanding development, even though, you know, this is, I'm very much presenting this as a sort of fun sort of exercise to do, understanding development will also help us to understand fundamentally when development goes wrong in, for example, cancer. So here are some simulations of the model, of the Turing model, and here are, um, in the early 1990s, people showed in chemical systems that you get these patterns. So this is called the SEMA reaction, and this is a Turing model. Um, this is the patterns formed in this chloride iodide malonic acid ac um, equation, uh, biological um, chemical system developed by um, two research groups, De Kepper, Swinney, and Duang, and they showed for sure that Turing patterns exist in chemistry. And even though Turing patterns seem to behave and seem to exist, seem to behave like, even though patterns in biology seem to behave like Turing patterns, there's still a lot of controversy as to whether or not these are actually Turing patterns or whether they're something else. Okay? So I now want to go back to developmental constraints. 
and to the effect of domain geometry and size. And those of you who know me know to your great cost that I believe that everything in life can be explained in terms of football. So I asked myself the following question. Developmental constraints, what that means is whatever the pattern is you have here, the pattern here and here cannot be more complicated. It can, it can be as complicated, it can be less complicated, it can't be more complicated. And I've shown you animal coat markings in which that holds true. So a natural question that should arise to you is, what about football coat markings? Do Turing patterns occur on football coats? Come on, you've all thought that, haven't you? So here is the coat marking of AC Milan. Stripes on the body and no pattern on the arms. Okay, these are boundary effects. We don't we ignore those. <laughs> Barcelona. Stripes on the body, nothing on the arms. Newcastle United. Stripes on the body, stripes on the arms. Not more complicated, still the same. Croatia, complicated on the body, nothing on the arms. Look at all these. I, can, I spent 45 minutes plus two minutes of injury time the other day looking on the internet trying to find a counterexample to Turing's model of pattern formation and I couldn't. So then I thought, what about rugby? Because I can remember as a child, the rugby shirts always seemed very exotic to me compared to the football shirts. And no, these all satisfy Turing's model. In fact, these are all pretty boring because what you see on the body is the same that you see on the, on the, um, on the arms. So, the conclusion from this is Either all football teams and all clothes manufacturers respect Turing's model and are mathematicians and love math mathematics, or it could be just a complete coincidence, or it could be an unconscious bias. Maybe because around nature we see these developmental constraints we automatically think when we design things that that's what looks nice and as you all know those of you in the university system or in the workplace unconscious bias is a big topic at the minute for, for example why is it that mainly men have the top jobs? Is it because un unconsciously, because we see men in top jobs, we automatically promote men? So unconsciously, we keep the status quo. So unconsciously, do we think, oh, that looks nice. Something with stripes on the body and spots here wouldn't look nice. So we don't do that. Here is a counterexample. Um, so some of you know Kit Yates from Bath. He was a former student of mine. And so he very kindly let me use this slide. This is his daughter. And you see here stripes in the body and spots in the arm. And he sent this to me. He said, look, Philip, this is a contradiction, counterexample to Turing's model for pattern formation. Here is another counterexample to Turing's model of pattern formation, striped fish, spotted tail. And another example, no, no pattern here and stripes here. Okay, so the, the theory isn't foolproof, 
But by and large, it works reasonably well on animals, and it works extremely well on football coat markings. Okay? So for the last few minutes, I just want to talk about another pattern formation, and that is slime mold. And I didn't want to forget this to mention to you Physarum. So if you don't know about Physarum, you really need to find out about it. You need to go and look it up on the internet. So Physarum is a um, sort of a slime mold. It's called the, the sort of true cellular slime mold. And what this does is it um, spread, it's sort of very capitalist. So if you put food in all sorts of places, it'll spread out. And where there's food, it will reinforce itself. And where there's no food, it'll kill itself off. And the net result is it creates a network that joins all the sources of food together. And it solves the traveling salesman problem. It creates the minimum spanning tree of all those sources. It also solves the, um, the f a maze. So you put a maze down, so you can look this up on the internet, and you put in the middle of the maze, you put a... Um, uh, some oat flakes, because it likes to eat oat flakes, and you put at the entrance to the maze oat flake, and you put the slime mold on top, it'll spread over the whole thing, and then it will slowly sort of kill off parts of it until it finds the minimum distance between the two points, respecting the maze. And in fact, a couple of friends of mine, Toshi Nakagaki, and um, uh, Mark Fricker, they actually won the Ig Nobel Prize for putting down um, oat flakes to represent train stations in various countries like Tokyo Underground, the UK, etc., etc., and then put the slime mold on it and look at the network that the slime mold formed and consider how it formed in, um, in real life. Okay. The UK one, they had to stop the experiment halfway through and put on a replacement bus service, but everything else worked very well for them. Okay. So if you look at the slime mold, what happened, this is now something called dictyostelium, um, a different type of slime mold. What happens to it is that when it runs out of food, it creates a, um, sends out a gradient, sends out a signal, cyclic AMP, and other cells attract towards it. And it forms aggregates. And it needs to form these aggregates because, it, because now it's got a situation where there's no food. It needs to go into spore mode, which is sort of like a sleeping mode, until there is enough food. And to do that, it needs to aggregate so that genetic information can be exchanged along each other and they can undertake this next um, form, this next differentiation path. And in fact, if you do a mathematical model of this, one thing I just want to point out of this, what you can find is that if you look at these the velocities of these waves, if you look at these waves and look at the wave number, what you find is the wave number changes um, with wave speed. So you get this type of behavior, this experimental behavior. And so what people thought was, well, if you didn't change the system, if you didn't change the biochemistry, you would just get this. So they concluded that during this process, the biochemistry of the system might change. And then with a graduate student at the time, Thomas Hofer, who's now a professor in Heidelberg, uh, what we showed was actually, if you have a mathematical model of this, you get this type of behavior with only keeping the parameters constant. So this is one of the main uses of a mathematical model because in many times, your intuition does not hold because these are very nonlinear interactions. So your intuition would say, if you keep the parameters fixed, then the wave number and wa is independent of the wave speed. But what this shows you is that's not true. So it's one reason why you need to do mathematical modeling. 
Now it turns out that these spiral waves that we see, see here occur in all sorts of media. They also occur in um, this is something called the, the um, belazov zabotinsky reaction. Uh, chemical reaction. You get these spiral waves. And these spiral waves arise because the system is what's called an excitable system. And the idea there is that you set off an activity like, for instance, in this case, an oxidation wave in the case of the slime mold, this chemical called cyclic AMP, and that stimulates the next part of the, the region to fire and form the pattern, and that stimulates the next part and the next part and the next part, and you get this traveling wave. And that's precisely one of the main ways or heartbeats. You get a stimulation at, at the sort of top of the heart, and that causes a propagation wave along the heart. And what's very uh, a characteristic of these um, excitable systems is that if there's any impurity in the system, you get spiral waves. So in the heart, if a piece of the heart dies, due to, for example, there's a blood clot and some blood doesn't get to that, heart, that piece of the heart, then that bit of the heart is different to the rest of the heart. So as the wave is coming along like this, the, the wave of, of calcium that causes the cells to the heart to beat, contract, if that wave comes down, it breaks up and you get this spiral wave. And that leads to something called fibrillation. And then when your heart, imagine your heart beating in response to a signal like this. It's not going to beat properly and then basically you're going to die. Okay? And so I read somewhere that somebody said that if you hold a heart that's undergoing fibrillation, it's like holding a big pile of squirming worms. And the thing that worried me about that was there is somebody out there who's held a big pile of squirming worms and has held a fibrillating heart. And the first thing that came into that person's mind when they held the heart, undergoing a heart attack, was this feels very like that big bunch of worms I was holding last week. Imagine if that person was your doctor. Okay, so what I'll do, I'll end there, and what I hope I've shown you is that, particularly that, that last example, the mathematics you use to understand the developmental life cycle of the slime mold is very similar to what you use to understand the blue sub zabotinsky chemical reaction. It's very similar to what you use to understand the physiology of the heart. So there's an example where the mathematics is the same mathematics for three very, very different systems. And I hope I've shown you how you can use mathematics to apply to things in biology to give more insight into biological systems. So I'll end there and thank you for your attention. Sorry, Philip Thomas, to describe this David Beckham number. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I forgot a bit. So, um, John told me I had to explain to you why my David Beckham number is three and what is a David Beckham number. So, some of you will know that um, mathematicians talk about Erdos number, and so Erdos was a mathematician, and if you publish a paper with Erdos, you have an Erdos number of one. If you publish a paper with someone who published a paper with Erdos, your DOSH number is two, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you who are not mathematicians might wonder why on earth should mathematicians funded by public money indulge in such nerdish behavior? Well, the reason is, think of the spread of, of disease like flu. And so you get the flu and you think to yourself, but I didn't interact with anybody who had the flu. How come I've got the flu? Well, it could be that you interacted with someone who interacted with someone who had the flu. So if you want to understand the spread of disease or the spread of rumor 
or the spread of virtually anything, you need to understand the network of connections. So studying the network of connections is part, you know, and so the Erdos number is a sort of fun little side part of this. Turns out there's a website where you can look up your Erdos number. And so a colleague of mine about 10 years ago said to me, Philip, your Erdos number is three. Did you know that? And I said, no, but bearing in mind that everything in life and indeed in death can be explained in terms of football, I thought the most famous footballer in the world today is David Beckham. What's my David Beckham number? Turned out it's three. I played football with someone who played football with someone who played football with David Beckham. So that's why my Beckham number is three. Unfortunately, it hasn't caught on. I was hoping that there would be a website and people would quote their David Beckham number, but they don't. Oh, well. Still, it's not too late. Thank you, Philip. Um, so I thank you for translating a great deal of serious mathematics and indeed biology into um, an intuitive form. Um, I also know you've typically understated your own central role in understanding many of those problems. So many thanks. Um, because of other things going on with the conference, we haven't laid on refreshments, for which I apologise for similar reasons. We're not going to take formal questions here. Philip has kindly agreed to stand at the front, so please come and pick his brain and ask him any questions you have. Um, but otherwise, we, we close the session here. Could we do so by thanking Philip again for a magnificent talk? Thank you.